a beautiful day. Good morning. Welcome to everyone here in the room and welcome to everyone that is watching. My name is Michelle May and I'm a violinist and flutist. I'm a therapist and a coach for creative professionals and I am your moderator for this session. For the next hour, we are going to be having a very important discussion around mental and emotional well-being. And we will be centering this conversation around how decision makers within arts organizations can make impact in this area. And in this particular gathering, we will also address these crucial decisions and how they need to elevate black and Latinx staff and artists. And we will also be taking questions, of course, from those of you here in the room and those of you online. I am very happy to have three esteemed panelists join in on this discussion. And I would ask that they briefly introduce themselves. Good morning, everyone. Wonderful to be here. My name is Dr. Angela Celeste May, and my background, <coughs> excuse me, is in clinical, organizational, and forensic psychology. I am also a vocalist, flutist, string player, and pianist. Good morning. My name is Tiffany McGlyde Blythe. I'm the Associate Vice President of Human Resources at Interlochen Center for the Arts. Um, I have over 20 years experience in the human resources area, so people, culture, quality improvement is kind of my, my specialty and my niche, and I actually came from a mental health organization, so I have over um, 13 years experience working with individuals with disabilities, developing challenging behaviors, so nice to meet everybody. Good morning, I'm Matthew Van Beeson, and I'm the president of the University Musical Society. Uh, we call it UMS for short. Uh, UMS is a multidisciplinary arts, performing arts presenter based um, in Ann Arbor, Michigan at the University of Michigan, but we work throughout um, Southeast Michigan. Uh, before I joined UMS in 2017, I spent 25 years um, in the professional orchestral sector, first as a musician, as a French horn player, um, and then working as a manager um, and uh, uh, in several orchestras in Houston and Melbourne and New York City. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so we always like to start um, with you know, defining where we are and what we are talking about. And so we are talking about emotional and um, mental wellness, but I wanna basically start off with talking about wellness in general. So um, I wanna find out how you define wellness overall in your organizations, and I wanna start with Tiffany. Well, thank you for that question. Um, wellness over the years has really evolved. If you think about it, at first people were really focused on physical health, um, here recently, you're now seeing all of the attention that's coming along with mental health. But in reality, wellness is a lot more than that because if you think about yourself as an individual and all of the different systems that impact you, finances impact you, your emotional well-being impacts you, your community, your spirituality, um, your community and the impact on the environment. There are so many different things that actually impact overall how your body processes that information and how you deal with those items. So I encourage you to go out, there's a lot of really great research and it continues to evolve and I wouldn't even be surprised considering all of the impacts that we've watched since COVID that you don't just see so much more information come out there on just overall what wellness means for individuals. Um, for our purposes, when I develop plans, I do think about all of those different components that, we, that I just talked about with a pretty uh, heavy focus for our employees on physical, mental, and financial health. And then I have like culture type programs that influence things like community, um, uh, your growth occupation actually is another thing that impacts you as a human being. So looking at all of those different components to make sure that we're taking care of a person overall. Matthew? Well, first let me just say that it's an honor to be on this panel uh, with Michelle and with Dr. May and with Tiffany, and I just wanna say right out front, uh, they have a level of knowledge and expertise that I do not, mm -hmm. um, and yet I am charged with leading, uh, a leading and a collective and an organization, um, and so it's really our responsibility now more than ever as leaders to be thinking about wellness, and I re we had a great conversation prior to today, and um, I think it's important to acknowledge that uh, classical music and the arts, probably writ large, have really not talked about wellness 
um, over the years, certainly for, throughout the, ma the vast majority of my career in this field. Um, it simply hasn't been discussed, it has not been prioritized, and so kudos to AFA and everyone at Sphinx for, for pulling this panel together, but also really prioritizing this topic. Um, I would say at UMS, uh, we have, we are, we are not a producing organization, we're a presenting organization, so we have a staff of just over 30 um, really, really super talented people, and when we think about wellness for them, um, as sort of Tiffany said, there's the physical side and, and the emotional side and, and the financial side, but it's also the sort of the, the right, striking the right balance uh, for people that they have wellness in their professional life, that they have a, a health and a wellness um, in that space, um, in their personal lives, and then how do the professional and the personal intersect? Do they intersect in a healthy way? Um, is one t far, far more dominant um, in an unhealthy way, and what can we do as an organization to really affect that and really nurture that? And I will say to you that we're not doing enough in this space, and I would dare say that most organizations like ours are not doing enough at this point, um, but we have to be more and more mindful of that um, because it's not just about our organizations being successful at what we do. We have to be successful at how we do it and how our people navigate that. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, to Dr. May, um, from an organizational psychologist perspective, what is defined as ideal generally for mental and emotional wellness and is there anything more in particular when we talk about this within artistic organizations? Oh, thank you for that question. Um, from uh, an organizational psychology perspective, um, first let me just uh, clarify what we mean by organizational psychology. Oftentimes we think of psychology and what psychologists do as therapy. You've got the person on the couch and you're, you know, you're, you're working through your issues. And definitely that's a, a large part of what uh, clinical psychologists do. But um, uh, organizational psychologists, basically we take our, our expertise and understanding of human behavior, thought, emotion, et cetera, and we go into the workplace to try to uh, find ways to help people within the workplace work better together for the good of the individuals and the entire, uh, the entire process. So from an organizational psychology standpoint, there are three key things to keep in mind. One is we consider a healthy organization to be one that fosters employee health and well-being. So it's a very uh, universal idea, and that should always, of course, include mental and emotional well-being. Um, the focus should also be on enhancing organizational performance because after all, the organization is there to perform something for the community. Um, and then to focus on connectivity um, as part and parcel of overall health. And I have to say in my profession, the focus on connectivity is relatively new, I have to say. Um, and because we are focusing on um, uh, black and Latinx uh, artists and individuals in our community. I have to say that for many of us, we already are instilled with that value. We come from communities in which connectivity is so important, and we lean on that for our well-being. So it's great to see that um, come into my profession also. Uh, so a healthy organization should also value that as well, connectivity with coworkers, with family, et cetera. Um, for artistic organizations, it's largely the same, but one thing I would add, and that is um, just piggybacking on what uh, Matthew was saying about how traditionally our organizations, our artistic organizations don't focus on that. I would take that two or three steps further. We not only don't focus on it, we actually have often done the opposite traditionally. That whole idea of sacrificing yourself for your art. We actually um, you know, encourage, uplift, and applaud people who just, it, it's wonderful to give all to our art, but all should not be to the detriment of our mental and emotional, even physical well-being. Um, so that's something I would strongly, uh, and that we strongly encourage leaders and artistic organizations to keep in mind. Thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna start with this question for Matthew. Do your organizations have specific initiatives or anything that address uh, mental health and emo or mental and emotional wellness? I'm gonna piggyback one more time on what Dr. May said as well, I, and take it one step further. It's actually been historically a culture of martyrdom in, 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 in the arts. And I, so I think the, one of the first things is the, the acknowledgement of that and the, and the intentionality and decision to step away from that um, in, in, in active ways, 
um, in, in ways that our systems of our organization. Um, so I would say that um, at UMS, we really, we haven't had a lot of systems in place to really be supportive in that space. We are affiliated and we are very fortunate to be affiliated with the University of Michigan, which does have a lot of resources. So one of the things we've been doing just over the last past year, past year or so is just making sure, and throughout the pandemic, making sure that our people understand the resources that are already available to them. Um, that is not enough in and of itself. There are, there are all types of counseling services. There are uh, direct uh, uh, emotional um, well-being services that the university provides. There's a staff ombudsman that people can go to. But it would be sort of a cop-out to not sort of, to just say that, well, that's enough. Those are your resources. We are actively thinking about uh, what do we need internally at UMS to really provide more resources in this space, from a human resources space, but also from a, a emotional and physical wellness space. So um, our intention is to, to have a dedicated HR resource um, in our organization going forward. Um, and I wanna really acknowledge that we've recently brought in um, a consultant, uh, Dr. Freya Harris, um, who has been brought on primarily to work with us in the DEIJ space, but in fact, Freya is proving an enormous resource already in terms of our overall working culture, how we interact with one another, how we think about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and justice in, in our workplace, but how we actually think about it permeating our culture. So um, these things are, of course, intrinsically linked to culture and uh, emotional and physical wellness. Um, and so, as I said before, I think there's much more that we can do in this space, but uh, we've taken, I think, a, some good steps in acknowledging that we need to do more and we need to have more clear resources for our people. Mm -hmm. I think that's very awesome that you actually, when you're thinking about leadership and making decisions and having that dedicated person uh, to handle these types of issues as opposed to a department. You know, it really shows that you have commitment and advocacy towards these issues. Um, Tiffany, what about at Interlochen? So at Interlochen, I would say we have uh, several initiatives going on that I actually am very proud of and think are pretty cool. Um, so since we're an educational organization and we're working with young artists, first of all, we have the Interlochen Five, which is one of the value sets of outcomes that we're trying to make sure our artists leave into the world with. And one of those is mindfulness, wellness, and resilience. So within that, um, we've done things, especially like this year, on having guest speakers in to speak to our students. A lot of those times that couples with faculty and staff um, to understand the impact, even in the slam poet that we had for Martin Luther King's day, there's been a lot of things that we've been doing intentionally to try to move that thread throughout the organization so our students are leaving into the world um, being productive in the spaces that they're going to. From an employment standpoint, we also have a lot of things going on as well. I'm still going to say it's, it's not enough it, because of its importance and the way that it impacts people. There are things that we're doing and we can continue to do better, but some of the things that we've done is since I started, um, if you think about mental health in particular, and especially with the exposure that it's getting now, access into those systems is pretty difficult for people to get to. And one of my biggest complaints with kind of the, the package that most employers get for people to try to resolve wellness is you have this EAP program that they give you and they say, hey, call EAP. And you call this person and it doesn't feel comfortable and you get there and you only get to talk to them for about three times. Well, how much can you really get with somebody in a three conversation section, especially when it's impacting you at the level that it is? Um, so when I started, we were working with Catholic Charities. That was our EAP provider. So there's already another barrier there, depending on what people's relationships are with the word Catholic. Um, so we moved and transitioned to a different program. We went to a program that allowed for more so that you're not so limited. So it does the episodic, but it does allow for more sessions unless it turns into something that's more medically driven. Um, in addition to that, how I talked about like my main focus has been like a component of all of those different 
different dynamics. So the physical health, the emotional health, and uh, the financial health. Um, through our communications with our employees, we try to con uh, consistently get them connected with those resources, whether it's a retirement organization, so people understand how, how they fi their finances are, because as you look at your parents and some of the things that you go th through, there's just a lot of different things that go on related to that. So those have been um, the starting pace places, but I would say the most important thing is, is to actually listen and you have to listen. So you need to make sure that you're fostering an environment for employees to be able to give you the information on what is it that you need or what they need from you as an employer. We have several different ways that we do that, either through surveys, we have a lot of focus groups. Um, and because of that, one of the things that I did learn is if you think about where Interlochen is located in northern, uh, northern Michigan, it's absolutely beautiful up there. I absolutely love it. At the same time though, people feel really isolated up there. Um, so isolation, that social component on I'm not getting enough interaction. So we've been really intentional on trying to do things to foster community and give people an easier way to slide into making relationships with others that they may not have naturally done alone. But you don't get that information if you don't talk and you don't ask. Excellent, excellent. <clears throat> So this is a question for Dr. May. So addressing uh, the mental health needs, particularly of black and, la black and Latin Latinx communities, um, we know that we're dealing with systemic issues of white supremacy, stereotypical mindsets, cultural trauma, and particularly, as Tiffany mentioned, isolation. Research from the community-based nonprofit organization Mental Health America found that 17 million people who identify as black or Latinx, Latinx in America have reported having a mental illness just in the past year. So that includes trauma, anxiety, depression, grief, and many other things. That's pretty significant. So Dr. May, what are some key components that need to be in place to effectively address those needs? And how should artistic uh, um, administrations and decision makers make that happen? Well, uh, as, as we've all said in various ways so far, um, it's got to be a multi-pronged approach. So you, we've got to approach it from the HR perspective, from uh, just every level. Uh, one thing I will say is that the American Psychological Association, um, they, they have a definition of what is considered uh, healthy organizations uh, as well as healthy individuals. Some of the things we've already kind of mentioned, like employee involvement, uh, growth and developing opportunities, health and safety initiatives, initiatives, and of course that has to include mental and emotional health initiatives. Uh, Work-life balance and flexibility, employee recognition, and effective two-way communication, and that also goes to what Tiffany was saying about listening. It's two-way communication, so we've got to do more listening to hear about what the needs are. Um, as a two-time former diversity delegate for the American Psychological Association, and also as a um, uh, co-founder of one of the chapters of the uh, uh, Black Psychologists Association, I would say that one of the things we need to do is um, redefine what we're calling mental and emotional health. Because even some of our definitions are very much, <clears throat> I'm not gonna say colored by, shaded by, <laughs> colored by, the perspective of the ones who are writing the book, so to speak. So uh, to their credit, the American Psychological Association has uh, tried really uh, hard to, to do better about the way they're even diagnosing and what they're even calling depression, anxiety, et cetera, based on information that, that uh, the organization is receiving from people in those communities. And I have to say a lot of that has been impacted by organizations like the uh, Association of Black Psychologists, the, the Association of uh, Hispanic and Latin Psychologists, Indian and Pacific Islander, et cetera. So that's, that's watching some of those changes in my field. It also feeds into what we need to do with artistic organizations. That means don't have a one-size-fits-all mentality, I would say, to leaders. Um, if you uh, are setting up initiatives within your organization um, to help address mental and emotional health for people in your organizations, um, and you have uh, black and you have Latinx people, should some of the people who are 
coming in to address those issues themselves come from the same background. It, uh, we talk about men, uh, uh, cultural competency. That's part of it as well, but someone from those same backgrounds. Some other things to combat um, the systemic nature of what we deal with from a white supremacy perspective is we don't want to make assumptions or we need to fight against making assumptions about what one person from a particular population might need based on generalities. At the same time, there's diversity within every group. So there, so we need to, again, like Tiffany was saying, ask the questions and listen, listen, listen. Um, we also um, need to tailor resources specifically to the needs of the people within our populations. So for example, um, uh, I've had the great pleasure, one of my longtime friends and colleagues, she's a black psychologist and she specializes in working with people who are deaf and hard of hearing. So as with every other population, there are general uh, concerns and things we need to keep in mind when we are working with artists who are from the deaf and hard of hearing community. Uh, and then at the same time, there are some real differences and real cultural differences between black deaf and hard of hearing and non-black or Latin, et cetera. So um, we have to continue to educate ourselves, ask and listen, and continue to grow in this, because um, we're all growing and continuing to learn um, in these spaces. Um, uh, and one other thing I, I, I want to mention as well, and that is sometimes when I have seen in, in, in my roles as an organizational psychologist working with companies and leaders, um, they come from the best of intentions and really, really seriously are committed to making these changes, which is what we need. But sometimes it's just a human nature thing. I, I know that people will come with a victimizing mentality, even if they don't mean it. So it's like, how can I? I know you must be so tortured. I know it. I know. I read the book. I, re <laughs> I saw the movie. I know. Bring it. So <laughs> again, we we want to be careful about make, not making assumptions. We want to listen. We want to be open and available to help in the ways that we need that, that they need because that in turn makes the entire organization strong. But at the same time, just just be aware. Be careful that we don't. You know. I'm here for <laughs> Exactly, excellent, excellent. Tiffany, um, anything from the human resource perspective on this? Um, I actually love what you, <laughs> what you just did there mm -hmm. because that is actually one of the components that you have, that you start to read and you see a lot more, especially with everything that's happened since George Floyd. Because mm -hmm. what I would say is, the last two years have been really hard for a lot of different people for very different ways. And that experience has been different. So my experience versus what your experience has been all different based off of all of the different things that have led to you. How I respond is different than the way other people respond. Um, people are generally good nature and they want to try to help. But in this, because there's so many people that have already had so much harm happen where they've been doing this immaculate list of all of the things that have happened that's like kept pushing me down, this happened and this happened and this happened, that by the time somebody does something and they were well intended in what they did, it came across harmful to somebody else. And really in those moments, it's really important on how we respond to harm because when we're trying to do something and we're doing everything the best that we can and that wasn't what you want and then you start feeling all of the stuff that comes on you because you tried to do something good, you try to rationalize what you did and it comes off as being more harmful for the person that you're dealing with. This is a very fluid situation. We're all human, we all make mistakes. And as a leader or as an administrator, it's really important that when you notice the harm has happened, that in whatever space it is, that you're owning it and you're trying to address the harm and you're not trying to rationalize everything that happened that led you up to that point. Mm -hmm. That's where most people get caught up. That's where most people end up getting all of the, the negative energy and it just continues to snowball into this relatively negative draining thing. So giving yourself grace, 
understanding and trying to look at other perspective is one of the things administrators can do in all of these spaces because all of these things are interconnected. Just like when you talk about the diversity, there's all of these things that intersect that make us the awesome human beings that we are. So having systems in place for people to feel like they can talk to you, actively showing them that you're listening and that you're trying to make things happen. Um, when things happen, because it can happen in mental health space, it can happen in any environment, just owning that and trying to separate yourself from the negative emotions that come with that and just focus on taking care of that person goes a really long way as well. Um, and for us, I would say, I, I find interlocking in a pretty unique situation. So when they asked me to join their team, uh, we were really focused on a lot of really good things and how are we addressing things like diversity, how are we addressing things like taking care of our employees. And the location of our organization puts us in a pretty in interesting location that just makes things even more complicated because there's only so many things that we could take care of from an organizational perspective. But then when you think about the community, how do you take care of the community as well? Um, so a lot of our initiatives have also been really focused on how do we connect with our local community at large because your employees not only live at Interlochen, but they have to live in the community and the community impacts them at work. So we've been doing more things like trying to get affinity spaces for people there, not just our employees, but also connecting to the ones that are in the community that also feel like they're isolated and trying to do and provide more resources to try to do that. So a one size does not fit all in this space because we've all been raised with very different values and we all perceive it very differently. The way I process it is very different from the way my husband processes it, and it's very different than the way my kid processes it. So going to the one-size-fits-all makes it that much more challenging, but it also makes it very individualized, which is the opportunity for community and connectiveness, which is one of the things that we oftentimes forget. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent. Um, when we're talking about these things, oftentimes we have, um, we might get pushback, there might be some challenges. Have you found that in any of your organizations? Matthew, I'll start with you. Sure, thank you. Um, this is a great discussion and actually extremely helpful for me, actually, mm -hmm. to be thinking about um, these issues and, and learning at every stage. Um, I would say that we have made some progress in our organization um, in both representation um, but still have work to do on the culture front. Um, and I was thinking about how, how perfectly Tiffany really talks about, you know, this, this really, this culture of listening, not making assumptions, um, creating a culture of listening. And I, I want to give credit, I have a colleague here, Alexandria Davis, um, who's here today waving, thank you, Alexandria, who, who said really, I think, a very profound uh, thing the other day in, in a meeting, which is that we don't often have a culture of asking for help that we don't, we may have a culture of listening, but what kind of culture do we have where it's okay to ask for help? Asking for help from a colleague when you're simply overwhelmed by your workload, um, but also asking for help or having enough resources and ways to ask for help in a way that feels safe and appropriate uh, for you as an individual. So um, I, I think we, we have some work still to do in this space. And so um, I, I love, uh, Dr. May really pointing out a, a very, very important thing for, for us as administrators, and, and that is that no amount of care and kindness disrupts systemic problems. Changing the systems fixes systemic problems. So I believe in a culture of care and kindness in our organization, but if you don't, if you're not determined to fix some of the systems and the things that are have been in place for a long time, then you will only see so much improvement and maybe you won't see any improvement. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Tiffany, any challenges and pushback, anything like that at Interlochen? Um, I would say I, I, I do a, f a thorough job of vetting organizations <laughs> before I decide to go. So being a part of the, the leadership team, um, I personally have not had a, had any challenges and pushback on any initiatives that I try to roll out within my organization. Um, but to be honest, I, I, I also said that I don't see 
some of what's going on is just my organization. I also see it as the community that I live in, and that's probably where I see and feel the most pushback. Um, so getting and being in the right partnerships, collaborating with the right individuals um, to try to help change some of the things that, that have kind of persisted. But people also knowing that your organization is fighting and that they care about these things and they're trying to help do that does help us as well. Um, I think it's really important as, as leaders that we are looking at the data and that we're holding ourselves accountable to the data because a lot of things that we generally want to do, um, sometimes they don't always work out well. And if you're not looking at the data to understand why that is, you can't fix necessarily that issue. So looking at turnover in your diverse employee hires, looking at turnover in um, employees that identify as having a disability, like seriously looking at those things and going, okay, I notice now every time we do this, this happens, let's try to get to the root, which is fixing the system of what's going on that's making all of the work that we're trying to do in these spaces basically continue to move forward, backward, forward, backward. Um, so that that would probably be the mm -hmm. biggest biggest challenge that I'm, I'm currently dealing with. Um, so yeah. Good. Can I add something to sure. also? Um, I have found that one of the reasons for the pushback, um, even in 2023, we're, we're getting better a little bit, but it, it's often that leaders of organizations and decision makers, they're not understanding or necessarily connecting the value of um, fostering, encouraging, you know, et cetera, mental, emotional, and I will add spiritual health as well. Um, I, I, as holistic beings, and that's a very, Af not that it's only African-centered, but African-centered psychologists talk about the whole person. So if someone uh, has a prayer practice that they need to go and pray at noon or whatever to make space for that, um, but I just, but in terms of just educating our decision makers. A um, couple of statistics I just had to share. Um, one, uh, one piece of research showed that thriving employees have 41% lower health costs um, and 35% lower turnover. So the, it's directly connected to the bottom line. We can see it anecdotally, but to have those numbers can help in these dialogues and conversations with decision makers in terms of why, why this is important for your company with what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent. How, how do we address the issue of access? Because a lot of times there are initiatives, there are programs, there's things in the community, but access, there may be barriers to access. So that could include financial, time constraints, I don't have insurance, many artists are facing that. Um, fear, cultural stigma, difficulty, accessing or receiving culturally sensitive care. You know, many of the clients that I see specifically want to see a black clinician. So how do we make that, those kinds of things happen? So yes, what, what decisions can be made on an administrative level that could reduce some of these barriers and increase access to crucial services that address mental and emotional health? And I'm throwing this out to anyone that wants to jump in on that one. Okay, well, I'll, I'll start. A um, couple, <laughs> couple, couple of things. Um, one is to use communication to reduce stigma and increase access to mental health resources. And that can mean lots of things, but w one of the most important things is don't wait until there might be a crisis. You want to normalize mental and emotional care as much as we do physical health and all of that, because of course it's, it is as important and tied to all of that. Um, don't wait until enrollment periods to mention mental health be benefits. It's often that afterthought, oh yes, and, and here's a pamphlet. <laughs> you know, after a 45 minute discussion of your physical health care, so we want more than a pamphlet. So don't, don't just wait until those open enrollment times. Um, e even monthly newsletters or something that ties it into the regular conversation, again, to normalize that as part of health. A um, couple more things, that is um, ensure that your executives mention emotional well-being every time they talk about recruiting talent and building an inclusive culture. Um, it helps employees and anyone involved in the organization, again, to normalize that, that should be part of the conversation, not the afterthought. Um, and then lastly, uh, offer workshops so employees can learn about mental health and resilience and 
all of that helps open up access because um, you also want to um, have an ongoing, again, not just at certain times, ongoing opportunities uh, to help teach people how to access, where to go, where these resources are located, and to support to support them in, in accessing that. Such a great list, which I'm not surprised about. <laughs> so I don't have too much more to add other than if you are a decision maker, um, actually evaluate the services that it is that you're providing. So um, like I said, when I first looked at our EAP program, the Catholic Charities, what was our utilization? Why is it so low? Like make sure that you have the right systems in place for your employees because that can be a part of the barrier. Um, another thing that I notice as a barrier is um, it's uncomfortable for people to access and to try to get into that system. And when you are looking for and want to be very particular, like I am, because I've been in mental health, so I'm super snooty and judgy on who's going to talk to my kid. Um, it's hard asking the right questions to figure out the connection because the other problem with that is when somebody enters the system and it doesn't feel good, they back out and they never re-engage. So it's really important that you're keeping the conversation open, um, that you're letting people know that when they have a negative experience, there are ways for them to advocate, to ask for the right questions, to talk about the qualifications. Can I have a male or a female therapist? Like all of those things are really critical questions and you, you don't necessarily know to ask, and then you don't get the outcome, and then you hop out. Um, so giving people the right support for advocacy to be able to advocate in that space is really, really important because I follow the data, and generally what happens is somebody taps in for a little bit, and then I'm out, and then they never go back, which doesn't help. I wanted to say too, for those of you that are um, in arts management organizations where you like for touring artists, um, thinking about your writers, um, you know, a lot of times when we're putting those writers together, we're wanting to find out, you know, we want the green room to be a certain temperature and the food and the drink and things, and you know, maybe they might, you know, need a certain amount of space, but what happens if that artist receives a phone call that, you know, there was some, a death in their family? You know, do they have um, an option or some way that they can reach out to someone that they might need to talk to? So maybe taking some time to find out. Right now, um, clinicians don't have to actually even be in that city. We, we're doing telehealth and many clinicians are um, licensed in multiple states so even taking the time to find out if you need to speak to someone we at least have a resource for you these kinds of things happen and they're often not uh, taken in, into consideration um, Matthew did you have anything you I, I'm so happy sure. that you brought this up because mm -hmm. I think it's a huge thing that we need to address whether we're a presenting organization like ours or whether you're producing and have a resident company of artists however you're interacting with artists this needs to be a front foot issue rather than, you know, or an active issue rather than a passive issue. And when we're working with artist managers, when we're working with artists directly, um, we as organizations, um, I think in the same way that we've not really thought about this wellness issue with, with our own staff and our own organizations, we've not thought of it nearly as much on the artistic front. So um, I'm really proud of UMS and, and the way in which we work with artists. Our team and our staff are incredible in terms of how they were thinking about not just creating the most uh, conducive environment for an artist to be successful, but their, their care and making sure that they understand the resources that that we can make available to them if they need. Um, but we have to be really vigilant with this and we need to continually push ourselves to say, how can we be more forthcoming in this space? How can we, um, I've, I've often said, sort of having worked in the professional orchestra land and then coming to this land, in the presenting space, you actually have the power of choice. Um, and so it's the power of choice to choose to work with certain artists who are also aligned with your values, but it's also to choose to work with agencies and companies and managers and people who are working with artists who you also share a set of values with in terms of how those artists are, are managed, how those artists are cared for. Um, and I think, that's, I think that's a huge, I think sometimes it's easy to feel in the arts that there are too many things over which you do not have control. And I would posit that in fact, you need to step back and say, 
where is, where, what are the choices that we're making and how do we make better choices um, for ourselves but also for the artists and the communities that we're trying to serve. Mm -hmm. Okay, we come to the portion of the program where we take questions and I, um, don't kill me, Sphinx staff, but I forgot to mention that you can um, address your questions if you don't want to come to the microphone on the Hop In app um, under chat, I believe. Or no, Q&A, Q&A, &A. that's correct. Okay, we would love to take some questions. Hi, I'm Brianna Garcon. I'm the current engagement liaison here Is your at microphone on? I, I don't think it's on. Think so. I hear it. It's on. Yeah, it's on. Hello? There you go. <laughs> Hi, I'm Brianna Garcon, the current engagement liaison here at Sphinx, and I'm going to read some questions that were produced in the Hopin app. Mm -hmm. One question is, in an educational setting, how do you deal with families, particularly those from cultures that are not traditionally American, that are apprehensive towards mental health? How do you begin the conversation with those who may not be open to the concept of mental health? Oh, that that question is right on time with what I was th what I was just thinking about, um, and what I was thinking about uh, is the fact that while organ while we're talking about organizationals making things available, organizations making things available and resources, which is very important, we also need to be sensitive that not only people who may not be uh, from America or from the United States, but even within, um, there are uh, in many of our communities and cultures in. Uh, black, Latinx, um, you know, lots of different cultures, mental health conversations are very stigmatized. So that, that is true, and we need to be sensitive and re recognize that even while providing resources. Um, I think one of the best ways, uh, or maybe one of the most respectful ways, I'll put it that way, to um, address that is, again, going back to what Tiffany was talking about, what we've been saying is to ask. If you're seeing someone whom you, uh, think might be anxious or dealing with something, some depression, whatever the case, you may notice something, um, to ask if they are in need of help, how are they feeling, um, tossing around some of the terms that we're used to, you know, therapy, and it's a, can be off-putting to someone for whom it's very stigmatized. So I think, again, that idea of meeting people where they are, um, asking if they, you know, do they want to have a conversation, do they want to have uh, uh, someone they might want to just like talk through a few things, you know, this starting very gently and seeing where they are with that. That's that's one way to start. I, w I would say I would agree with that. Um, I, would s I would say I know it is absolutely an issue within particular pockets of community. Um, so when you're dealing with those issues, generally speaking, being very aggressive about it is not the way for that dialogue to happen. Mm -hmm. Um, the best way when you're trying to get somebody to see a different perspective is just to ask questions. So it's asking, is understanding what is their particular barrier, and then after you understand what that barrier is, is having conversations about, well, what other ways can we go about addressing it? Well, what would it look like if we tried to do something along these lines? Um, why don't we evaluate and we come back? So a lot of times, especially now where everything feels so polarized, you already have in your mind that this is the right answer and this is the way to go, but you can't get that right answer for somebody else. They have to come to that realization on their own and when you listen, when you're respectful, when you ask the right questions, you show them you're, you care, you're supportive, they generally come along the way, because that's also the way I handle DEI. Like when you can't see that other person's perspective, there's generally a barrier there that's physically making it hard for them to move forward. So asking questions is a really great way to break down barriers. Hello, my name is Dorian Block. I'm a Sphinx lead fellow as well as uh, the social media manager at the Dallas Opera. But um, you touched on working yourselves to death essentially in this industry, the show must go on. How as a leader and as a colleague do you empower those you're responsible for or at the same level as to prioritize their mental health and emotional health and physical and financial? I think that's a good one for Matthew. <laughs> thought I might be asked to talk about this first. Uh, look, I, I, I think it's it's the right question, and I would say that, um, to be honest, those of us who've been in the business the longest are the least well-equipped to answer it. And so I think what we have to be 
smart about as leaders um, are two things, listening and really creating a culture where you can really listen and, and frankly, since the pandemic and since George Floyd, I mean, it's really the younger members of our staff who have really helped inform things that we needed to really work on. Um, and it was born out of some, frankly, some pretty charged, high stress sort of conversations, but it's super important to be able to listen to people across your entire team, black and Latinx members, LGBTQ, people from other cultures. Um, uh, you know, it really helped them inform, and I feel the same way about artists. Artists are such, you know, anytime we take it, uh, the decision to really let artists lead the way, it's, always, it's, it's almost always, if not always, a, a better result. Um, artists just have a wisdom that sometimes we can't see, which is what makes them special as, as artists. Um, I would just say that um, we have to step away from that culture, that culture of, uh, we talked about at the very beginning, this sort of martyrdom culture, culture of growth for growth's sake, uh, the culture of if we do more and more and more, we'll be better and more effective. Um, we really, it's a real, moment sort of coming out of the pandemic, it's a real opportunity for us to step away from some of those traditional mindsets, uh, the dominant logic, as it were, um, in our field. And then the last thing I'll say is, and, and I'm struggling with this each and every day, as leaders, we have to model the behavior that we're looking to have throughout our organizations. Um, and, and that includes being vulnerable enough to, to, to tell a colleague and say, you know, I'm taking advantage of counseling services at the university, here's, here's what my experience has been. Um, because people need to know that it's okay for them to do it, and not that it will necessarily make a huge difference, but I just think it's about transparency and, and modeling the behavior that we'd like to see throughout the organization. Okay, I'll just add one thing also. We we're talking about resources externally, which is very important. But we also want to empower our people that you know self-care is extremely important and that's part and parcel of it as well. And that means lots of things, de-stressing, yoga, whatever, you know, whatever you need, prayer time, whatever. Um, but that that should be part of the conversation for the care of artists, self-care as well. Actually, this is part B of Dorian's question. Because <laughs> interestingly enough, and this maybe divine or something like that, Dorian had, Dorian questioned, I have a part B to his question. And it's a pretty cool question, and you actually, Matthew, kind of hit on it. My name is Claude Graham, I'm a Sphinx Fellow, I am from Miami Music Project. Do you think America is working too much? Greater demand, we have greater demand, you kind of hint on that. Greater output, but less input. So that was some of the, and me being an educator in the school system, you know, they toy with the idea of do we go to a four day um, school week versus a five day school week. But here's the thing, one of those days, take a shorter day and make that a mental health day that how can you require employees to be involved in mental health, even if it's just yoga or something like that. But my que the question is, do you think America is working too hard? Working too much, is there greater demand, greater input, less, a greater output and less input? You know, I would say, you know, even if you go to a four day week, what's in those four days? <laughs> you know, that doesn't, for, it's not the week itself, it's the content, it's are we, in, what, what is the, the culture behind doing those things? Because you can have four days and be just as burnt out. I don't know how many of you all are aware of the book, I just pulled it up, Rest is Resistance, are we, does, have you all heard about that book? Yes, um, if you have not, you should be looking at it, and it's uh, Trisha Hersey, and she's, it's basically all about that, about the fact that we need to be radically relaxed, <laughs> um, that it's just as much a part of what we do, to your point, um, as everything else. But yes, again, a four-day work, work week, a four-day school week is, um, is, is not helpful if we're still on that same, you know, hamster wheel. On that hamster wheel. Oh, I was just going to add that um, yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> um, we know it anecdotally. Research has shown it um, that America, you know, that that 
um, you know, that work ethic, which which is it's great to work hard, but the grind that the grind, you know, that you know, which is literally like a grind. Um, but uh, same research has shown for other similarly minded uh, cultures, Japan, uh, the United States of America, you know, these places where it's about the work and the climb up the, you know, whatever the ladder may be have the highest rates of stress and all of the negatives that come with that. So um, yeah, we, we do need to be radical about changing the way we view these things and va again, valuing, valuing the rest as much as the output. And that just makes everything, everything better and the output has more quality. Hello, Rima Dayl from The Hop and App asked, what are best practices to handle work situations where headline news interrupts the day, where BIPOC folks are triggered in a different way than white colleagues? Example, Tyree Nichols and the mass shootings in California. So that's a really great question. Um, and I'm very fortunate that we've been working to add a lot of resources in that space to be able to do that. So generally speaking for us, um, especially since we have young artists that we're, we're fostering, um, we actually hold space and we immediately hold that space and tell them that space is available for them. So um, we tell our educators these sessions are coming up, here's how kids can access, and we encourage people to access it in whatever way is comfortable. Because remember, for some people, they handle things differently, so an affinity space isn't necessarily going to be the answer for them. It may be talking to family. It may be actually uh, engaging with a mental health provider. So you want to provide as many opportunities for, for number one, a awareness, um, and then B, making sure people understand and helping them get into whichever one feels most comfortable for them to be able to engage in. Hi, my name is Drew Collins. I'm a uh, double bassist. And uh, I had a question particularly for uh, Dr. May. So in my own spiritual journey, I've recently kind of come to the crossroad of generational trauma and dealing that with that with myself. And I've recently kind of realized that, you know, uh, an organization like Sphinx, as and as a member of the black community, we all deal with that in a lot of ways. And I really wanted to hear your input and maybe your thoughts on ways that we can uh, deal with that in either community, group setting as an artist, or uh, individually, or as together. Just curious about what your ideas are on that. Thank you. Excellent. Uh ec excellent uh, question. And thank you for sharing that as well. Um, well, in terms of generational trauma, um, I can assure you that that is, and, and again, research has shown this, uh, they're now understanding that we literally hold at the cellular level the trauma generation to generation. Um, that's just, it's a human thing, and most definitely we see it in black people, for sure, um, uh, living in the United States. Um, there are lots of answers to that, I think particularly for artists and black artists and traumatized people of color, we have a unique opportunity because of being artists to express some of those things in ways that maybe those who don't have some of the cre that, that creativity in that way are able to. So um, I would say to, in terms of individually, Use your artistry, use your creativity to, to express that. It's a very healing thing to do. As a psychologist, one of the things, and counselor, one of the things that we often encourage clients to do is to journal. There's something about getting it out and down, getting it out, um, that's very, very therapeutic. Uh, so journaling, writing about it, and then again, expressing it in as many ways, paint about it, draw about it, sing about it, whatever. It's very, that can be a very healing thing. Um, and likewise in, you know, there's something, again, going back to like the uh, some African-centered thinking in psychology, uh, that idea of healing circles. There are healing circles um, where small groups of people will, you know, uh, gather together specifically to hold space and time for generational healing, for trauma, um, you know, those kinds of things. And drumming is also often a key part of that, regardless of the culture that you come from. Science has shown that there is that 
you know, connectivity between that, that drumming sound and the feel and the frequency and a healing aspect. I almost liken it to, um, if any of you have kitty cats, I had, I had a long time kitty cat, Malcolm. Got to put throw up Malcolm. Malcolm <laughs> for 17 years. And uh, science has shown that when cats purr, it literally heals, right? It, he it heals humans. So you hold that kitty and they're purring. It's the vibration. So the vibrations that we make from music, from drumming, there's, there are many different ways to address that. But I would say to explore individually and in small groups and talk about ways in which you can do that. Hi, my name is Kimberly Schutte with the Chautauqua Institution. I guess I have part C uh, to the question about the culture of martyrdom. I w was wondering if you had any insights or suggestions about managing up. Um, you know, we have people above us or who have been there longer who have made great sacrifices and I think they feel a little judged or invalidated for the choices that they made if we're trying to change the culture. So how do we, how do we balance that as well? How do we manage up? <laughs> I might ask you the same question. I, look, I think the, the reality is, is that when you're in a leadership role, you have to allow yourself to be managed up from time to time. And there are going to be people, we, we are part of the University of Michigan, but we have a governing board, so um, I'm, I don't report to anyone at the university. I have a board chair and uh, a board of approximately 30 people. They, they are the ones I report to, technically. Um, so there's, from time to time, some managing up uh, from me to them. Uh, but I think this has been one of the biggest, like personally, just over the last four to five years, has really been to, to understand how, how do I really, how do I listen, how do I take things on board, um, how, how can I really create a, as many ways for, to hear from people as I can. And I will say to you that sometimes within kind of traditional management structures, it doesn't always go over big. Um, because sometimes it feels that people who are in more senior roles are sort of like, well, wait a minute, I, you're supposed to just listen to us not necessarily people across the organization. I want them listening to their teams as well. So it's, uh, there's no easy answer for it. It's it's day-to-day -day work um, and intention in that in that space. Um, and uh, and it also means, you know, hopefully, you know, with, with Black and Latinx members of your team really developing um, r a rapport that, that allows them to feel like they can, they can give you truths when you need them, regardless of where they sit in the hierarchy of the organization. I would just add on to, you know, managing up is a pretty difficult thing for people to do, mainly because of the power dynamics and the fear that's kind of in the relationship for having a really open conversation. Um, people, that, I've actually built most of my career off of managing up and really a core component of that is the relationship and having conversations where you're able to take the emotional piece out of it for you that you're not throwing it at that person and it's coming across as judgy. So it's really hard when things impact you to have conversations with people that feel hard like that because it's impacting you so hard. But if you take time to really think about what is, your, what is it that you want to get out of this conversation or what is it that you want to make sure that person takes away, because if you think about communication for the person to receive it, the way they get it is also pretty, pretty intentional and pretty important. And a lot of people often forget that step. So it's hard to have a hard conversation with somebody that you don't have a relationship with. Um, and that's the reason why that social aspect is so important for individuals on developing that relationship and then knowing when you have knowing because of the relationship dynamics, then you can go in and start having a little bit more of those, those conversations. But managers have the same issue too, because you know here's this issue going on and this is what I want and I want to come down like this, but in the end game, if you come down like this, they're not gonna move. So who's winning out of that conversation? You really have to think about it that way. Okay, we have time for one more. Hi, I just wanted to say a quick word about the, the kind of the mind-body connection and Freelance artists, you're talking a lot about employers and, and of course, the student population, but people who don't have an employer who are just out there in the world doing their thing. Um, 
I was lucky enough to come up um, during my student years uh, through the Civic Orchestra of Chicago, the Chicago Symphony's training ensemble during the, uh, the golden years when Michael Morgan was our artistic director. And we, I was lucky enough to be part of a very close-knit group of friends that formed you know, lifelong friends, three of whom um, were black uh, men. And all three of them are dead. And all three of them died of cardiovascular issues. And you can say, okay, maybe they didn't, you know, eat exactly right, or maybe it was genetics. But you know, I've read a lot about how there is a clear correlation where black men are more likely to die of this stuff because of the accumulation of anxiety from just existing every day in our world. And the thing is, um, yeah, maybe each of them could have benefited from therapy, but more. Um, more immediately, the stress that they lived with, and they were all happy guys, you know, but just the underlying stress that they probably didn't even notice or think about in a, um, all the time. Um, we, our friend group, and the, the, and the last of these friends just died um, this last summer in my home, and one of the things that he was suffering from was the fact that the second friend who died had died in his home um, not that long before. And in retrospect, all of us, especially the, the white people in our friend group who maybe have spouses, who do have health insurance, we're realizing these guys didn't have health insurance. Mm -hmm. These guys didn't get yearly physicals. And I feel like, especially this last friend, it was so preventable. If only he had gone to a doctor, gotten a bit of meds, he would still be with us. And this is a mental health issue that translates to a physical health issue. And I'd love to hear you guys talk about what all of us could do to better look out for each other. Because as far as our three friends, it's too late. Right. Well, actually, our time is up, but I'm going to just briefly, um, I think we have addressed a lot of this already um, in terms of just being aware um, with your relationships with each other. Um, if you see someone in stress or in, um, with some side, you know, in distress, talking about it, you know, not making this something that's stigmatized and something that we absolutely don't talk that's about. We missed it. They weren't stressed. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. But we, we know so much more now. Now, and thank you so much for sharing that, but we know so much more now than we did years ago uh, to be able to just say, you know how we always are saying, check in on your strong friends? Yes. We need right. to be doing more of that. Okay, I'm so sorry, we do have to wrap up for right now. I just wanted to make a quick note that in our the Hopin app under this um, a schedule um, in this session. We have put some um, extra re resources for you all. I want to thank our panelists for joining us today and thank you all for being here today. Enjoy the conference. <laughs>